so how do you apportion copyright? Is it possible yeah. to own the output to something that the original programmer doesn't know exists? Would it be feasible to have also pocket <laughs> efficient hardware in the sense of the cost of buying yeah. a smartphone powered by it? No, like, I got you. A year ago, Canada, India granted a patent to AI. One of those two countries realized we f***ed up and they flipped, right. they flipped the decision. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Nearly AI podcast. Today we have Jason Esragian. How to pronounce it properly? Smashed it. How is that? You got it. No, 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 you Smashed got it. it. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Esragian. Nice. So he's an assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and he got a bachelor and a PhD degree from the University of Western Australia. He has a postdoc from the University of Michigan, and he has done a lot of work around the area of spiking neural networks, which is what attracts us here today. Also, he's the co-founder of the Open Neuromorphic uh, Community and Open Source Code and Hardware Initiative in the field of neuromorphic research. Welcome, Jason, and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So let's start with the, um, with the Open Neuromorphic Group. Do you want to share some insights on what you do there and how people can interact with the community? Yeah, for sure. Look, it was, um, it stemmed because a bunch of us were bored. No, um, we, we found that there, there weren't very many uh, communities uh, related to uh, the software and the hardware intertwined. So I guess that's what neuromorphic research is all about, building software that is optimized for hardware, hardware that is optimized for uh, software. Um, and you find that hardware is very often closed, right? It's one of the fields that is that has an incredibly high barrier to access. A lot of companies are very, very um, protective of their secrets, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? If you build a chip, if, if you're relying on technology from Intel or TSMC, they don't want to give away their secrets in the process technologies. And honestly, it's gotten so complex to a point where they, I mean, there's probably no single one person that could even tell you all of the secrets because there's just so many damn steps to manufacturing um, silicon chips at this at this point in time. Um, so no, we, we developed this community that was all about sharing our work, sharing code bases. Uh, we run hackathons. Uh, we run in-person events, sometimes co-located with other conferences. Um, and we have a Discord channel full of, I guess, educational materials, webinars, seminars, lectures, a lot of talk and memes uh but, but it's it's a whole it's a sweet wholesome community so yeah i'm sure if you google it open neuromorphic you'll be able to find uh i don't know some like-minded people who, who are willing to talk and we can leave on the description all the links uh, for your community so you guys can get in touch with the open neuromorphic uh, community so we will talk today about the spiking neural networks okay and Although this channel is more of a, for a business oriented audience and this topic is like the most technical concept you can <laughs> think of in AI nowadays, I thought it was kind of interesting to try to demystify it and think about it yep. in terms of the application uh, point of view. So the first time I heard about spiking neural networks, it was in at my very first conference uh, where I submitted my first paper. Yeah, that was 12 years ago. 12 years. Yeah, Damn. that's uh, before they were cool. Good, it was yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, before AI and everything was cool, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and I don't remember anything about that conference, but yeah. spiking neural networks. Yeah. Like that catch my eye, okay? Right. But I then never, you know, got into the feel yeah. of truly understanding it, but it was like, whoa, man, this, this thing is like... It's pretty crazy. sexy. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. sexy. <laughs> so uh, from those 12 years, I never got the chance to fully understand spiking neural networks. Now I don't think I have the brain capacity to understand spiking neural networks. <laughs> so assume that I'm pretty dumb, that I am a 10 years old kid. What are spiking neural networks? So what's kind of ironic is me explaining to you what a spiking neural network is. It's like teaching a spiking neural network what a spiking neural network is, because that's what you're using to understand what I'm saying, right? Your brain is just a bunch of neurons that are interacting with each other through spikes, right? Okay. So, I mean, if you think about a regular neural network, the stuff that's kind of taken off, the stuff that uh, is used to power chat GPT, et cetera. Um, every one of your neurons is active, right? Every neuron is talking to almost every other neuron or whatever other neuron that it's connected to. Um, with spiking neural networks, the idea is that 
we want to take more inspiration from the brain. And there's a lot of reasons why we might want to do that. Uh, in most cases, the, re the best, most compelling reason is power efficiency. My brain is able to, it's, it's powered off just a ton of coffee. Whereas ChatGPT, if I pour coffee on the servers there, it doesn't have the same effect. Um, and how does it do that, right? There's a lot of theories. Um, one of them is that the brain or the, the, the neurons in the biological brain interact via spikes. And so it's like taking that principle and trying to smush it into what deep learning has done or potentially even graph theory. So, I mean, it's not necessarily constrained to the deep learning world but it's ultimately trying to encode information in the form of spikes. Now, if spikes are just random bursts of voltage, now I'm not sure if a 10 year old knows what voltage is, but let's assume you do. It's like a, a sugar rush. A, a, a sugar, thank you. A, a sugar <laughs> rush from, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've got the caffeine rush from the, from the too much coffee I drank this morning. Um, the a sudden burst of your sugar rush, right? That's communicated to another neuron, that's communicated to another neuron. But, but you know, this voltage burst is thought to be very similar across all instances. So every neuron that communicates is, in a way, it's doing the same thing. So if everything is the same, how do you distinguish them from one another? How do you distinguish spikes from other spikes? So the idea is that information might be encoded in time. It might be encoded in when the spike occurred. It might be encoded in the sequence of spikes or how many spikes. Those are really kind of, un I mean, I want to say uncharted territory, but really it's just very uh, challenging territory, right? There's a lot of experiments that indicate that this type of uh, spiking encoding theory is correct, or that's, that type of encoding theory is correct. So on my side, the goal has been trying to understand not how to copy the brain, but how to make use of the brain, right? There's certain things in the brain that uh, everyone agrees on, right? The generation of a spike is through this complex movement of ions, diffusion and drift of ions, right? Am I trying to replicate that exact ion motion? No, I honestly, personally don't care too much about that because in silicon, when you're, when you're thinking about chips, when you're thinking about the hardware that we have access to, we often don't have access to those ions. So given the constraints and the benefits of modern silicon technology, how can we take advantage of the information that the brain has to give us? Okay. Right. And are you doing that because of the energy efficiency that that carries out or because of the type of modeling and the type of functionalities that that could bring? Yeah, a bit of both, uh, especially the energy efficiency angle. I mean, if the brain, if you can think about it like this, if a neuron is sufficiently excited, if you have enough sensory input into a neuron, then it spikes, right? Mm -hmm. When it spikes might be a very precise question that's separate to this, but the point is that your neurons, your brain is going to be in a rather low energy state or a low power state when there's nothing to excite it, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can take inspiration from that and put that into a neural network so that every neuron in, the, in a model isn't active when it doesn't need to be, then you might be on the right path towards enabling lower power neural networks. So that's one angle of it, right? Then of course, you also wanna consider what application makes sense for that, right? Like if I wanna take inspiration from the brain, does it make sense to use these techniques for large, large scale models, right? Does it make sense to make a spiking version of GPT-4 that, in that encapsulates all of human knowledge derived from the scraped from the internet? I, I don't think we have a fixed answer, but it's probably not. It might be a case of having access to some neural network that may be personalized or tailored or adapted to specific circumstances. That's often the, that, that, that's kind of what we expect uh, or where we expect spiking neural networks to really flourish. There are of course other factors like latency is also good. You, you win a bunch of latency. I mean, if you don't have to process every single neuron, then just pay attention, focus on the ones that are relevant to you, right? Um, and perhaps on a more uh, less technical side, I feel as though if, if we were able to crack the code of how neurons communicate with each other, how the brain works, then that might even lead to pushing towards understanding how, how to align neural networks towards human values a little bit uh, better. Okay.
No, I, I attended the, um, I would say it's a conference, it was more of a meetup. Yeah. And there is this guy, his name is Luis Sarmento. He's like one of the main promoters, I would say, of uh, a conference that was called The Future of Computing, where they explore like how is going to be computer in the future, like neuromorphic computing, sure. like chemical computing and, yeah. and other forms. And at this meetup, he said that we are like the smartest computer per unit of energy. Yes. I mean, our brain. Yes. We are, maybe we are not as smart as ChatGPT to memorize stuff yep. or as smart as a chip, whatever to compute stuff at four gigahertz. Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> but exactly for per yep. unit per unit of energy, we are like the most efficient machine yep. in the world. And people get scared of artificial, you know, intelligence. Like we are going to be, we are going to have like a superhuman intelligence, like somebody that is smarter than us. And his question was like, maybe we can, but do we have the energy in the world to run that AI? Yeah. Level? And do we have that energy? And that, that's a, that's a deep question, right? I, I would say that, so once upon a time, I would have been very skeptical, right? I would hear people referring to AGI and I just kind of brush it off and ignore a lot of that conversation. Cause it just, it, it, yeah. it honestly just felt like a lot of noise and yeah. hype. It still is a lot of noise. It yeah. still is a lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then, yeah, when you do see um, a lot of these crazy emergent properties from LLMs, and how scaling up models gives rise to a lot of other capabilities, it doesn't seem so implausible anymore, right? For example, it, it, it seems as though when you have a really powerful LLM, I mean, it's not as good as, I want to say that it's not as good as your average human at logic and chain of thought reasoning, but it isn't bad either, right? For, for short enough chains, it, it does a pretty damn good job. And who knew that solving language could inadvertently solve logic that is needed for planning in robotics, right? So the idea that all of these things can kind of feed into each other does have a very general or AGI yeah. flavor to it. Now you're, you're adding vision to the question, so yeah. it starts getting crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Environmentally, like, of course we want to be like as eco-friendly, like environment friendly as possible mm. and training AI models like takes a lot of resources. Yeah. Uh, what about spiking neural networks? Are they more efficient both on training and inference? How does that work? Yeah. So it depends on how you tackle the problem. Now, if, if you said spiking neural network and you're referring to the brain, then well, yeah, the running cost of a brain for inference training, which are two things that are not decoupled from another, the, the, the two things are happening at the same time. That's something like 20 watts, right? Rough back of the envelope calculation will tell you that, yeah, your brain is running off 20 watts. In contrast, that's with, like an apple and a cup of coffee. Apple and cup of coffee gives me 20 watts, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, for context, yeah, it's, it's roughly just, just a little bit more than powering your average light bulb, right? Mm -hmm. A tungsten light bulb. Um, in contrast, training your large scale LLMs was something like uh, running a medium sized nuclear reac reactor for a month, right? which is, I mean, if you have sustainable sources to power that, great. Yeah. If you don't always have that, you can't always rely on that. Um, so you always have some less sustainable fallback. Um, okay, so that, that's, that is what it is. Uh, I think there are some non, like unofficial estimates from people that put the number uh, at like $5 million-ish to train an LLM, uh, which you could argue- To train it once. To train it once. Uh, thankfully, you do get a bit, of, a bit of reuse. You get some transfer learning and whatnot. So, so you could amortize that cost a bit, but it is a one-time upfront cost that you pay. Well, you would hope it's one time. I'm sure these companies have variations of their models that they're training and retraining. But then once you deploy it, you are then putting that one model into the hands of billions of customers, right? And so the estimate, unofficial estimate for inference per day for ChatGPT was something like on the order of $100,000 per day. Right. So how do you make money off that business model? I think that's something that the AI community and OpenAI in particular are still trying to figure out. Compare that to spiking neural networks. Now, if I was to take the deep learning techniques, use backpropagation the same way that your standard deep learning models were, were trained, and I apply that to spiking neural networks, then it's equally crap, right? Equally shitty. Okay. 
because we're using the techniques from deep learning, which is kind of ironic because that's what a lot of my research is about, right? We're trying to see, can we optimize spiking neural networks using techniques from deep learning? And it's expensive, right? So another threat of research is what are alternative ways to train uh, spiking neural networks? So on one hand, you might look at purely biologically plausible rules. So there are, there are certain things that happen in the brain that we're certain about, other things that are just theories. And when we're less certain, we have feelings from experiments that indicate that something might have happened. But one example of a, of a biologically plausible uh, learning rule that is highly distinct from backpropagation is, say, spike time dependent plasticity, STDP. It's a series of experiments from 1998, so 20 something years ago. And these guys took a pair of neurons that were connected to each other and they just probed and, and they modeled the relationship between the timing of spikes, the relative timing of spikes between the two neurons with how much the weight between them changed, right? They found that, you know, if you're, the, the timing of spikes was very small, if, if the two neurons fired very closely in time to, to one another, then the weight would exponentially ramp up, right? It, given that there was a, se a particular sequence as well. Now, if I put that into hardware, it's incredibly cheap. If I, if I had to give you a number, I would say on the order of a thousand X cheaper than the cost of backpropagation, which makes sense intuitively because every weight is being updated based on signals that are immediately local or adjacent to the weight itself. So the primary cost in semiconductors and processing and whatnot is the movement of data, right? Yeah. Calling inference or training an LLM involves distributing la massive, massive layers across multiple GPUs. And before you can even pass data to layer two, you need to gather and accumulate uh, data from four or six or so how many ever GPUs. And it's not the computation, it's not the multiply and accumulate of neurons, it's the movement of data, yeah. right? And the idea behind STDP is that if you want a weight update, you don't need that. All you need is computation from signals that are immediately next to the weight. So you don't need to move data off to GPU number 712, right? Yeah. The weight update is a function purely if nodes immediately adjacent to it, whereas backpropagation needs some global loss. That loss is then turned into a number of gradients equivalent to the number of weights you have. If I have a billion parameter models, I need a billion gradients. I can't move all of them at the same time. There's a limited bus between these GPUs. There's a limited bus within GPUs from the processor to memory. And so that's gonna bottleneck my computation and lead to this insane energy cost. So from the training perspective, if you went down the road of biologically plausible methods, then without a shadow of a doubt, things tailored for spiking neural nets are gonna win there. But why should STDP be useful, <laughs> right? Backpropagation is you know, gradient-based. It's, it's functional optimization. It's task-specific. It's driving down towards some objective. You're going into some local minima and you're achieving something functional. These brain-inspired methods, STDP, that's an experimental observation between two neurons. It's not an optimization algorithm. <laughs> so how far does that get you in terms of usefulness? The answer is not very far. People have shown that it is able, able to learn certain correlation, uh, correlations in input data. They've been able to solve MNIST, the, the okay. grand challenge of deep learning. <laughs> but the point is that it's not super functional or it's, it's not super functional, but that's also not its point, right? Yeah. So a big part of what we're looking at is how can we take these local learning rules or learning rules that are tailored for, um, for minimizing communication between a lot of GPUs and getting to a point where you still achieve the utility of backpropagation. So my, my feeling and the feeling of a lot of people in neuro AI is that the brain probably approximates some form of gradient descent. And there is some work that we've done that shows that SD, STDP is, it can be shown to be a smaller part of the backprop through time algorithm. So it could be something that it, it's just like one piece of a much larger, much more challenging puzzle. That's on the training side. I know you asked me a very simple question, which no, no, could have been answered in four words. Um, the inference, so let's say that I've gone ahead and used backpropagation to train a spiking neural network. Is inference efficient? 
if I run that on a GPU, nah. Okay. Same, same shit. <laughs> same shit as a regular deep learning model. The idea of spiking neural networks is that most of your neurons are quiet, right? You're hoping that you can train your model to, to achieve a function, to minimize some loss function. But additionally to do that, while your neurons are limited in communication, right? Now, what that means is that GPUs are poorly suited for spiking neural networks. So GPUs and any typical accelerator is transferring tensors of data. You're moving vectors, you're moving matrices from layer to layer. Spiking neural network hardware, for the most part, uses uh, the transfer of packets. So it's much, more, it's much more fine grained. What that means is that if a neuron isn't spiking, you don't transmit that zero value over. Okay. GPUs, yeah, you're transferring a tensor. There's gonna be a bunch of zeros. You're gonna compute with the zeros. You're gonna take that zero, multiply it by a weight in your memory and of course. move your computation forward. So if you're using neuromorphic hardware that is aware of the sparsity available in spiking neural networks or the lack of data that needs to be communicated in spiking neural networks, then you're able to get on the order of 100 to 1000 X improvement in inference. But that's just using the very limited hardware that's available today as well. I think, and, and I think that there is a lot of room for exploration to keep optimizing that hardware, right? Um, so if it, a rough answer would be 100 to 1000 X, but it isn't an apples to apples comparison either because deep learning as it currently stands far outperforms spiking neural networks, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And is it, ex I know this kind of hardware is not yeah. deeply commercialized as it is with a GPU, but assuming that, so let, let, let's assume spiking neural networks get up to the performance or they beat traditional deep neural networks. So it creates a lot of demand for this kind of hardware. And then a lot of research happens on this kind of hardware and we commercialize it like on your nearby store. Um, let's that's say the that, dream. Yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> is producing this hardware uh, cheap also, or is it too, super expensive? Hardware is hard, man. Yeah. <laughs> hardware is hard. Uh, so I would say that it's, I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's more expensive or less expensive than, than GPUs, for example. Okay. Um, but the upfront cost of designing and building hardware is very damn expensive. Yeah, yeah I'm um, assuming that cost is covered. Yeah. And then you have to, to create an extra chip. Because my question comes yeah. from here, right? So the main issue we have now with uh, large language models, yeah. with generative AI, is that they are so large and they require so much energy yeah. that you cannot truly decentralize these models into any yeah. person device. Right? Yeah. Of course, there are some attempts of putting these large language models on smartphones, etc. But then you will run out of battery, most yeah. likely. So we, if we want to have AIs that are on your pocket, maybe the current solution is not enough, right? Yeah. And we will need energy efficient hardware on your pocket. Yeah. To, will it be feasible to have also pocket <laughs> efficient hardware in the sense of the cost of buying yeah. a smartphone powered by them? No, I, I got you. Yeah, no, so I think different people will, uh, will have slightly different or very different opinions on this. So my take is that if I wanted the performance of chat GPT in my pocket, then I personally don't think that's going to happen in the foreseeable future. Uh, if it was to be running locally without any remote cloud server based access, um, why? Because how can I fit 1.2 trillion parameters in my pocket? Um, every one of those 1.2 trillion parameters it's gonna be either four bit or eight bit or 32 bit floating point value. That requires a shit ton of memory. Memory can only get so small for now. There, are, there is a lot of research in figuring out how to make memory more dense, how to do 3D packaging um, to stack memory on top of each other, um, which comes with a whole slew of its own issues and challenges. Um, so I'm skeptical that we'll see chat GPT type models at the edge. What I'm not skeptical about is the ability to take a subset of ChatGPT, a subset that I need, right? It's very unlikely that I will ever use the part of ChatGPT that knows Romanian, right? Um, that's a lie. I do have a colleague that's Romanian and it could be useful. But the point is there is a ton of ChatGPT that I will never tap into. 
So if you manage to train chat GPT in a way that could be divisible, then it could, which actually people do, right? I mean, what a mixture of experts, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, it's, it's ask the probe the expert that you need. So, so it's a form of coarse grain granularity, right? Called coarse grain sparsity, yeah. um, coarse grain granularity. It's so you could imagine that you only need one expert at a time. And this is just one example that I'm improvising here, right? You can take one expert at a time, load that up locally on your edge hardware that takes 1.2 trillion parameters down to a billion, which is still a lot, but more feasible in your pocket. And you run that locally, right? And then maybe you cache everything else in a server. Uh, and once you need to tap into another domain of expertise, your phone mm -hmm. says, oh, yep, current model's doing pretty badly. So my point is that it's spikes are a, a pretty good fit for that. I mean, spikes are doing something that looks like fine grain uh, sparsity, but I don't think that's going to be the ultimate solution in of itself. It's it's one part of a much grander puzzle. Yeah, because you still need the memory there. Even if it doesn't trigger every time, you still need to have the model. On exactly, the exactly. So some friends of mine um, who were curious about spiking neural net said, well, why, don't, why don't you just compress your model using distillation? Why don't you go from a larger model to a smaller model using knowledge distillation? And hey, they make a great point. There are many cases where that is more effective than spiking neural nets. The thing about using knowledge distillation though is you're still accessing all of your weights. Whereas I feel if you have a spiking neural net, you should in theory have access to more knowledge. There's more capacity in there. You're just, you're assuming that you don't need all of that capacity at once. Yeah. Which is how a brain works, right? You got your auditory cortex, visual cortex, motor control, et cetera. There's a lot of parts of your brain that isn't fully utilized. If you did fully utilize your brain, all your neurons were active, it would literally melt. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, my concern there is, you know, as more applications are getting into um, into AI, okay? Yeah. I mean, we have to recognize that AI is pretty, sm is pretty smart, but it's not very efficient yeah. form of calculation, right? So if you want to sum two plus two, it's more efficient to actually add the two numbers <laughs> than to ask ChatGPT yep. to add the two numbers. Right? <laughs> But a lot of applications are moving from traditional software engineering yeah. into much more of an AI uh, yeah. complex behavior. And that will demand a lot of energy from edge devices, from your smartphones. And if your entire, for example, now people is talking like, are LLMs a potential operating system? That's like an open question. Like, yeah. will an LLM be able to handle all your operating system in your smartphone? Well, maybe we get to that level of intelligence mm. But it will it be energy efficient for your smartphones to have all your apps powered by, by AI? Most likely, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all relative, right? Yeah. Um, and if you if the thing that we're being relative against is a what's two plus two, uh, I would want a uh, two bit adder to do that. A two bit adder. Don't know exactly. Maybe that's forty transistors to implement an LLM that tells me the answer to two plus two <laughs> with 1.2 trillion parameters yeah. where let's say we're using SRAM. That's, I don't know, six to eight transistors per memory cell, six to eight times eight bits. Let's assume eight bit weights, six to eight times eight, 64, 64 times 1.2 trillion. That's a little bit more <laughs> than a four bit adder. <laughs> yeah, so it, yeah, I, I like that point though. It kind of gives the spirit that you know, maybe we're thinking about AI, uh, not in the best way. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to port everything over to AI. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to port every type of workload to spiking neural networks either. Spiking neural nets encode information over time. So does it make sense to do static images using a spiking neural network? Probably not, because there's no time-based feature in, um, in, a spi in, in an image, right? Humans are time-varying machines, right? Our brains are continuous in time. We're constantly trying to predict what happens next. Where we're, you know, there are great theories about predictive coding and how we're trying to forecast what's about to happen. And in doing that, maybe our brain goes into a lower energy state and we only update the state of our brain or we only update our beliefs when reality doesn't match what we expect. And so that, that's another theory completely separate to spikes or somewhat separate to spikes that could explain energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, that's not really integrated into AI. Um, Actually, time doesn't exist in AI, right? And in computing, in general computing, like there is no notion of time. Like, right. We have like discrete moments, 
Yep. Uh, Computers are discrete machines. Yeah. So, so I mean, the way that we're handling spiking neural nets at the moment is if, if we want to train them on a computer, if we want to train them as a neural network, then we have to discretize them in time. And okay, maybe that's a little bit counterintuitive. Unfortunately, that's the best we've got at the moment. That's the best performance that we can get out of a spiking neural network to discretize them and, and run backprop through time uh, on them. There is a whole slew of work being done on continuous time hardware as well, um, analog hardware, something in between that it could be asynchronous hardware. Um, all the chips out there in the world, um, well, okay. most, most processors out there use clocks everything has to be in lockstep. You have yeah. T equals zero, T equals one, you're know, incrementing in discrete steps, but asynchronous hardware is data driven. So you only go to your next step on the arrival of data. EDA, so electronic design automation tools that allow for um, scaling up chips to, to build large scale chips, they, you know, there, there is still a lot of improvement needed for okay. asynchronous chips. There's some really cool work coming out of Yale from uh, uh, Rajit Manohar's group that builds um, asynchronous design tools. Intel's chip is an asynchronous tool. Um, mm -hmm. Some of their work was also derived uh, from Rajit's work. But if I told, if, if you told me, hey, build me an asynchronous chip, then I would say, shit, I would need to first figure out how to gain access to those mm -hmm. programs, sign a ton of NDAs. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and there isn't- But maybe the future for Spiking neural networks is there. Is that's it's, right. It's on the hardware. More. That so I'm a chip designer by training. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I got onto spiking neural networks because I did hardware, and then COVID happened, and I was like, "Damn, I can't get into the lab. So what can I do instead? All right, let's let's try to optimize the hardware by going up the stack over to algorithms. Okay. If data communication is the issue, let's reduce it by training models that have less data communication." Okay, so you 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 said something that catch my yeah. attention, which is we wouldn't use spiking neural networks for images because there is no notion of time, and they are good at you know representing mm. time, mm. at least that's their part, their goal. But for example, for biomedical applications, I mean, our bodies like like a continuous set of reactions. Yep. And, so for that type of projects, I, I mean, biosignals, if you go to healthcare domain, yep. everything is biosignals and everything is on a continuum, right? Yep. How the sugar rush evolves uh, when you drink yeah. uh, sugar, you know, I don't, I don't know, uh, ECG, EEG, whatever. It's, it's all, all time varying. It's all time varying. So maybe on that type of very niche domains where mm -hmm. time is a crucial factor yep. for decision, Maybe that's a good point to apply spike in neural networks. Exactly. And in most cases, a lot of biomedical devices need to be in the form of wearables. They need to be low power. Exactly. And so it ends up being a perfect fit. So we've done a fair bit of work on biomedical signal analysis using spiking neural networks. Right. One of the things that we were really interested in was forecasting seizures, for example, because um, it turns out that you know, keeping a diary of every one of your seizures over the course of many years to try to identify patterns is either very unreliable if you leave it up to the patient or very expensive if you need to pay a neurologist to do that for you. <laughs> so trying to forecast and uh, or detect on the fly in, a, in an ambient setting is pretty damn hard without having something really energy efficient. Um, so that, 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 that is something that we're really interested in. Of course, it's challenging to deploy not just spiking neural nets, but anything AI related due to the lack of uh, guardrails, the lack of safety uh, yeah. mechanisms in place, which goes back to the point on, um, should we do two plus two with an LLM? Um, there are certain things that need to be in place to ensure um, your neural network behaves the way you want it to behave. So one funny project was, um, or we, we were kind of bouncing back and forth on how to do, how to do neuro, closed loop neurostimulation to suppress Parkinsonian um, uh, symptoms, right? And what we were thinking was, all right, we could use reinforcement learning. We could reward two things, low power on the stimulus and I guess reduction of alpha beta oscillations, which is what gives rise to physical uh, shaking. And we thought, okay, so what if the model we use is too good and 
the neural network feeds back a huge current delivery. And in doing that, it kills your patient, but it optimizes the objective because now your alpha beta oscillations are zero. <laughs> That's not an optimal outcome that an LLM would be yeah, able to give to you, right? <laughs> so yeah, you, you do need, I, I really think you need to complement these things with some explainable form of, um, it could be machine learning, it could just be a rule, it could be a, a hierarchy of rules. Whatever it is. There's a good book about that. I think I have it here. Yeah. It's human compatible. Uh, it's more about how to build the right loss functions and the right rewards yeah. uh, for these models. So in biological applications, I do see a strong match between, of course, not today, but maybe 20 years from now, between spiking neural networks, if we are able to put the right hardware on wearables and then to analyze this data. But the current... The current trend that I have seen on a quick research I did on spiking neural networks, like there is a lot of, there are a lot of attempts uh, trying to put L, spiking neural networks at the level of LLM tasks, and text, at least for written text, is not time dependent, or it's not continuous. <laughs> let's say. Yep, it's yep, not yep, continuous, yep, yep, right. So maybe we are trying to force spiking neural networks into being something they are where there is not their goal because in 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 in, in text read it and text you have a discrete time every word is a single word yeah or every token whatever you define it is a single word but and now I, I i will tell you why i don't think this effort is useless because we are now used to text in written form and we are surprised by the effect of the text on written form but what about audio? Because audio has a lot of nuances, yep. right? And if I say them, or if I say them, you know, the same word yeah. has a completely different meaning. Yeah. And if we put a spike in neural networks to analyze text, not on written form, but on audio, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe there you got, you got a little bit. So possibly, now, if someone was to play devil's advocate, then they would say that even the audio that you're recording is sampled at 48 kilohertz in the <laughs> digital world, right? Okay. Um, so I guess it, it kind is. of becomes, what's the granularity of what you're recording? But the feeling of what you say, the spirit of what you're saying is absolutely true, right? If you have some hardware that is operating in continuous time, maybe your analog circuit, it, it could be a world where you don't need to digitize your signals. Or all microprocessors are dominated by digital processing because it's it's very scalable i could write a bit of verilog code and generate ten thousand transistors in the space of an, an hour right wouldn't be optimized but i could generate a ten thousand transistor uh, circuit without thinking very hard but if i want to build an analog circuit then putting together 20 transistors i have to keep in mind i have to keep track of every one one of those transistors size their width their length how close they are. Um, analog design is hard. There are efforts to make it scalable and AI assisted um, or machine learning assisted, um, but it is really hard. There is a huge, huge design space when it comes to analog circuits. But if that's where we were to go, then your front end circuitry that records damn or damn, right? And then you could process it in the continuous time analog domain as well. And then feedback and it gives some output maybe that's when it goes digital whatever but then in that case then it's truly continuous and it truly would make sense for continuous time audio in the way that we're currently working with spiking neural nets where we we're stuck discretizing them anyway to make it backprop compatible then it does still work with language because there are sequence uh, dependencies in there the word at the start has some varying relationship with every word in the rest of your sentence or paragraph and in that case it's fine, right? The, the point doesn't become continuous time learning, but rather just the reduction of traffic of data transmission through your model. So for that, if you're comfortable with the, the, the utility of spiking neural network coming from sparsity, then it's fine. I think there is still a lot to go, a, a lot of way to go before you, we, we find the true place for spiking neural nets. And it, it could be that continuous time is, is kind of the key that we're not paying as much attention to. Okay, so we could say spike neural networks are good or should be good if we are handled with the, if they are used with the right hardware on being energy efficient on managing time um, and the energy efficiency comes from the sparsity. Where are they bad? 
bad. Where are they bad? Let's let's go. <laughs> so this is the second episode. <laughs> Man. Oh, okay. So deep learning one, because uh, uh, for all of your machine learning techniques, neural networks dominated because of the hardware lottery, right? A, a few things, but one of the major things was the hardware lottery. GPUs existed. Damn, we figured out how to optimize GPUs for convolutional neural nets. Bam. Then we had exponential growth of neural network models, um, their capacity, their capability, everything. Spiking neural networks don't take advantage of the architecture of GPUs. There definitely is a far longer pathway for any sort of commercialization or for even um, overcoming what deep learning is capable of. So if I just take all of the advances from the deep learning world and smush them into spiking neural nets, which are basically, you could think of them as in the way that we're doing them, the, the way that the majority of the community is doing them, they're just binarized recurrent neural networks. And there is a reason why the deep learning community moved away from vanilla recurrent neural networks, right? Shitty memory, yeah. right? So there is no way that we would ever be able to beat the deep learning crowd if that's what we're stuck doing, right? You're not going to get better loss convergence through binarization. So I think what becomes important is identifying where they're good at, right? And that's in reduction of traffic and avoiding them where they're not needed. So there, there are many places in hardware that don't need a reduction in traffic, right? You could think of it as, let's go back to the example where I have an LLM distributed across multiple GPUs. Within that GPU itself, there is so much, so much compute power, right? Do I need spikes? No, maybe not. There's, there's not much communication. It's just a shit ton of compute, right? So it could be that I have a boundary layer that is encoding data in time, that is communicating data through these sparse spikes to other GPUs. So it's kind of this hybridized system. And, and, and honestly, I think that that is closer to the brain. You, you might've heard that a, bi a single biological neuron is more complex than your average large scale neural network, right? You've got this rich dendritic tree with all of these dynamics, right? These nonlinear continuous time dynamics. And it's all of those things that give rise to spikes or the absence of spikes. And that is something that we're honestly missing in the spiking neural nets that the deep learning community are paying attention to. Um, because they're really damn hard to optimize using gradient descent. So a spike, we're treating it as a single bit one or zero, right? Zero is great sparsity, but what a real action potential looks like, what a real spike looks like is this sudden rise in a voltage and then a decrease and then some refractory period. And then it hits some steady state, negative 70 millivolt uh, resting potential. If I was to take a model that, if I took a model that was as close to perfect of that voltage fluctuation, then you would have a highly stiff ODE, a highly stiff ordinary differential equation. If I apply gradient descent to that, it is really, really difficult to optimize. Okay. So I'm not going to get very far training something like that. So the thing that is really setting spiking neural nets behind the deep learning community, is one, they're binarized, deep, it's, it's binarized recurrent deep learning. So we're limited in how much we can do. But then secondly, and perhaps more importantly, we're perhaps trying to force them to be something that they shouldn't be, right? We're trying to make them deep learning algorithms and maybe that's not the right way to go. Maybe that's not even their why you are working with. That, exactly. I mean, yeah, it, it's wild because I've kind of like built my career up with this paper called Training Spiking Neural Nets Using Lessons from Deep Learning. We've got SNN Torch, which takes PyTorch and applies it to Spiking Neural Network. It's, it's brought a lot more attention to Spiking Neural Networks but in a way it's also uh, lost a bit of creativity in the other things that spiking neural nets really should be. I, on the open neuromorphic discord, I often get questions like, hey, why isn't my GPU more efficient with spiking neural nets? It's like, well, because it's a GPU. <laughs> Still the same GPU, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I could give you some neuromorphic hardware, but man, I ain't rich yet. So. <laughs> but yeah. Do you see any other, any other form of hardware and that could support spiking the neural network. So we have neuromorphic hardware. They, I, I know there are some experiments with like biological hardware or chemical yeah. hardware, or things like that. Yeah, no, there are some groups that are working with organoids. And I guess that's as, um, 
biologically plausible as you can get. <laughs> um, no, so organoids are just little pieces, 2D, uh, 3D slabs of uh, biological matter. And I guess the matter that we'd be more interested in as neuromorphic engineers taken from the brain, right? Some sort of cortex that is, pro that is capable of processing. So some of my friends in uh, Melbourne, in Australia, they're, they're at Cortical Labs, a startup that takes brain tissue and they're trying to see how to, you, you might've heard of this one. Um, they trained a little slice of brain tissue away from the brain to play the arcade game Pong, right? So they, they how, how did they do it? They kind of- And there was a brain tissue from a human? A human, mice, lamb, one of one okay. of three. But probably not human, given FDA yeah. <laughs> yeah. or IRB. Sorry, as you're doing international waters. Or yep. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Um, no, no I, I think it was either from a mouse or rat or a, a lamb. Um, Australians love lamb, so it was probably lamb. Uh, Can get maybe. <laughs> yeah, man. The the brain just fucking hopped out of the of the. Um, glass substrate no so so what they did was they, they had the game pong where you have your um platform you can control it and you just want to avoid the ball from going past the platform they resembled the position of the ball and the position of the platform using some electric stimuli stimulus and every time they had a good rally they would reward it using some predictable signal and every time they had a loss they would punish it using a random signal so there was some essence of reinforcement. I mean, it, it was a little bit ad hoc, but it's kind of impressive because it worked, yeah. right? Um, they managed to train an organoid to play Pong with very rough global signals. Like they, they, they didn't have control over the specific synapses, mm. the weight updates. No, they're just like applying- a very coarse feedback loop? Very thing. coarse feedback, which is, it's, it's amazing that they got it to work in the first place. Um, so some colleagues of mine at UCSC have done similar tests with organoids. They've gone in the, th the third dimensions, their, their, their brain tissue is now 3D. Um, they've been able to replicate the results. That's great. What I'm personally a little bit more interested in isn't necessarily how to, how to make a brain organoid play games or how to train a brain organoid, but rather understanding how it was trained, understanding how it learned. So, Imagine this, what if I, I think we, we could agree that the brain has global signals, some dopamine rush that is broadcast to many, many neurons. An organoid lacks that global signal, right? It's, it's, it's thought to lack that global signal because it's a smaller slice, right? There, there's some low level dynamics going on, but it doesn't have access to the rest of the brain. So it's not a perfect replica of the brain. In a sense, the experimentalist that's applying some stimulus to that organoid is playing God. They're, they're playing the role of that global signal. Okay. So we could ask the questions of, all right, in absence of, a, of global signals happening naturally, what's the most optimal global signal? Can we use that knowledge once we've found the most optimal global signal that enabled learning very quickly? Can we use that to infer the global signal in the brain that enables learning? That's what I'm really interested in. And that could be then taken to the deep learning world where you trade back propagation for some approximation that is far more efficient, right? If I have many GPUs, instead of having a billion trillion gradients being routed, imagine just sending the same signal across every wire. Still, there is a lot of data communication there, but I don't need to keep track of all that communication. And that is way, way cheaper than independent in unique signals, right? And so that, that, that's kind of like a completely different paradigm for learning. Now it's hard because organoids are tough, they die. Um, the, the, yeah, but, there's a lot of challenges. But, <laughs> I don't know if, that's, if this is the case, but I mean, for the first part of this episode, we have been trying to talk, we have been talking about putting a biological, biologically inspired model into silicon yeah. hardware, right? And now we are seeing has been for a while, but now it's becoming famous because of Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink yeah. uh, chip that we are trying to put hardware in biology, in biological mm. organisms, right? Sure. Like we are trying to put a chip on the human brain. Yeah. Do you see any research being carried out by these organizations that are trying to 
put chips on humans neural implants and around the spiking neural networks or around more biology biologically inspired learning mechanisms yeah no so i haven't seen any research that specifically takes implants into humans i think a large part of that is simply inspire what, what, what do you want to put into your brain something that's highly performant or something that is energy efficient at the cost of binarized activations right so i guess if i don't want to be plugged into a to, to an electrical outlet i want to be something that is not as performing but some energy efficient or you will be eating the whole yeah, thing the, the truth is you need both right you need That's energy right. efficiency and, <laughs> yeah, but most importantly you need it to work as well as it possibly can otherwise it's very challenging yeah. to get any sort of approval for that yeah. um so yeah no the, the implant direction quite limited the the amount of power the milliwatt microwatt level of power that you need um to have some always on implant is uh there are people that are creating them but very limited in the sense of having one as a co-processor okay. um, to supplement. And the current research is more with traditional computing yeah. and yeah. not with neuromorphic yeah. power. Tra it's, it's either signal processing on chip or it's going to have some relay back to some, maybe uh, something that's placed behind my ear or something in my pocket. Um, and it's going to do all the processing away uh, from the chip itself because there's just not enough resources um, okay. on this chip to, to you think if, if you want to give a prediction and i know it will be super inaccurate <laughs> on when how and where we will see spiking neural networks in a practical application yeah no i mean i think that the even though medical applications are one of those that are ripe for spiking neural networks there is just a lot of that there are a lot of steps to not just getting spiking neural nets but regular neural networks deployed in that setting largely because it's such a high risk um yeah. setting you, you need the best performance and quite often these are applications where people would say you know what if you need power to get better performance then i'll pay that cost yeah. right if it comes to human well-being yeah. let's throw money at that problem yeah. and so i think that there's going to be a it, there's a longer leeway um before you arrive at having spike neural nets in medical um, applications what doesn't have a leeway so th this is like the classic professor bullshit to do you ask me a question i tell you the answer to the opposite question if you wanted to see a spiking neural network somewhere in a way i would argue that they're kind of already out there right um so what happened was uh th th this needs a bit of historical context but a group at um eth zurich so to toby delbrook one of the main guys in the neuromorphic engineering field he's kind of there from the start his, his his advisor at caltech is the one that coined uh carver mead he coined the term neuromorphic um now toby in in roughly around 2005 2006 invented as part of his research he invented uh, an event camera right it's this camera that only captures motion so it suppresses any static pixels and only processes pixels okay. that are changing right which makes a lot of sense in the field of say autonomous driving if your car is stationary well, that's fine i don't need to keep processing i know that everything is just the same as what it was two seconds ago traffic light hasn't changed don't keep processing it not until you see red go green right so he developed this camera um that became commercialized something like 10 years later so you could go ahead and purchase it um and a lot of people were taking that and it felt like a good fit for spiking neural networks why because the input even though the it's sparse. sort of yep it's it's sparse it's more continuous than regular frames because every frame is independent sorry every pixel is is independent of other pixels it still has that sampling rate because <laughs> you know at the end of the day everything goes digital um but you know what they've taken event cameras and you know apple's vision pro headset they use event cameras to do eye tracking, right? Okay. And that makes a lot of sense because you have very high speed saccadic motion in your eyes. So, so sure, you, you could try and sweep your eye from left to right. It probably takes hundreds of milliseconds to go from A to B. Okay. But without you even realizing, the moment you walk into a room, you have this saccadic high yeah. speed motion. The purpose of that motion, it's, it's motion that you barely notice. But if you go to bed, peaceful, it's like very, keep a bit of light on try and consciously keep your eye dead still you'll find that it's impossible to be 
dead still, right? There's always a little bit of motion. That's just part of our biology. And the reason behind that um, action is it's all about depth mapping. You're trying to get a bit of motion so you can consistently create a depth map with some parallax what? of your environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that's the point of saccadic eye motion. And the time scale for saccadic motion is like 5 to 20 milliseconds. You have saccades okay. occurring at time scales of 5 to 20 milliseconds. Can a frame-based camera capture that? If you have 25 FPS, that's 40 milliseconds per frame. No, you've lost it. Okay. An event camera that's able to capture 60 million uh, spikes or input events per second, <laughs> yeah, that can capture it. That's at microsecond okay. resolutions. So it makes perfect sense to be, if you want to have seamless eye tracking, that's the kind of speed that you need. So we've okay. got neuromorphic technology from the sensing side already out there in real world products. Okay. It's not necessarily branded as neuromorphic and that's totally fine, right? It was developed from inspiration from the retina but now it's a it's a solution to a real world problem, and that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> right. So those are the kinds of places where I think spiking neural nets are. You know, it's low risk. Of headsets, VR headsets, or augmented reality uh, is not very. It's it's not high risk. It's a kind of it's a it's a very elastic good. <laughs> you know, exactly. pe people with money are going to throw money to buy yeah. <laughs> Apple's headset, so you can afford to have. Uh, um, whatever fancy technology you want in there, you can build specific neuromorphic hardware to integrate into those types of products. That's what I think is going to have the shortest time horizon for okay. um, this specific brand of technology. Yeah. Okay. Saccadic, you're, you're still blown at the depth yeah. mapping from saccadic motion. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy that we are all constantly trying to map depth. <laughs> yeah. I never thought about that. On the topic of mapping, you and I are very well mapped. I'm just taking a look at the screen. Yeah. We're dressed exactly the same. Yeah. We've yeah. got some mirrors. It wasn't on purpose, guys. This wasn't on, on purpose. purpose. <laughs> purpose so let's try to <laughs> fuck up YouTube's algorithm for a second <laughs> with an additional question that doesn't have, that doesn't make you know, any sense with the initial part of this episode. We were having lunch uh, on Monday. Yes. And we were talking about copyright stuff around usage of data. So we're on Final question around this. Do you have a background in law? Yeah. So you studied electronics engineering and you studied... Law. Okay. Yeah, no. So I came out with a law degree in 2016. Um, shit, how did that happen? I've got eth I've got ethnic parents. They like your, your average ethnic parent will say something like doctor, lawyer, or failure. Okay. <laughs> so what choice did I have? <laughs> um, no, so no, I did... Um, I love you, mom. I'm just kidding. Um... <laughs> I no, so I, I did engineering and law. I, I I didn't really know what I wanted out of life, so I said, "Fuck it, let's just do both." The moment I fail one of my courses, I'll just drop that one. But it took a little bit longer to fail than anticipated, and I was like, "You know what?" By the time I failed my first course, I was too deep. It was like third year. I was like, "All right, now I'm stuck. Now I've got to do, got to keep doing both." So it it was a long, um, long degree. Um, I, de I ended up pursuing the engineering. So I went to the engineering PhD, but, but I was also like, I, I didn't want to be a lawyer. But they could notice that you like that part. But I like that shit. It's, it's fascinating. It's real world. It's, 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 there are rules that impact day-to-day yeah. -day decisions we make. And so no, I, pay, I put a lot of emphasis on intellectual property um, law, okay. copyright law. And so during my PhD, completely separate to the work, the, the tech work that we were doing in, PhD, which was actually all about building um, retina-inspired image sensors okay. that I was talking about with the event cameras. Um, the just in my in my spare t a lot of spare time, right? I wrote this paper, but before LLMs took the front and center stage, and we were all talking about GANs at the time. So really shitty generative images, but it was still pretty awesome. There was that website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, which was mind blowing at the time. You just refresh and just generate infinite people with really fucked up ears. That prompted me to think, all right, who owns this, right? Who, who, who created this? So I kind of went down this rabbit hole and I asked the quest, I, I, that I asked that question, not from a who should own it, but rather given the law, given copyright law as it presently stands, who does own it? <laughs> right now different countries have different law of course the good thing about copyright law i mean copyright law is a mess right even with even before you throw ai into the equation it's all right it's, it's a mess it's yeah. difficult 
it's, it's in, it can be inconsistent as well. But you know, all, a lot of countries are signatories to what's called the Berne Convention. So everyone is kind of agreed on how intellectual property should be handled. Is if if every country has different IP law, then that's just going to incentivize companies, businesses to go to the country with the most favorable intellectual property law. Um, so everything is somewhat standardized with subtle variations. Um, and so I targeted you know, how did these variations affect what a court might perceive uh, on who the court might perceive to be the owner of AI, uh, of, of AI generated work. So this extends to images, this extends to, and it extends to the text generated by LLMs. But the key, well, what I kind of found, so we, we, if you want more detail, then there's, there's a paper in 2019 or 2020, I published it in Nature Machine Intelligence titled Human Ownership of Artificial Creativity. It breaks it down for non-lawyers to understand uh, what, what's going on. Of course, it might have changed because 2020 to 2024, it's so four years, but it's like 400 years in AI time, <laughs> right? So a lot changes, but no, what, what, what it basically comes down to from a copyright perspective is this. If you want, some, if you want copyright to persist in something that is, you know, that, that falls into the category of artwork or literature or whatever, then it needs to be of human authorship Right, there, there typically needs to be some element of originality and okay. ju judges in the past have linked originality to be tied to human authorship. Um, and there are some other criteria like fixation and like it needs to be fixed in a tangible medium. Like, can I copyright a dance that I don't record? No, it's not fixed. But if I take a video off my dance, then I That's own the copyright to that fixed video. Okay. Um, a lot of weird questions about does an ice sculpt is an ice sculpture fixed? <laughs> as long as it's in a freezer, it's fixed. But no, no, yeah. let's let's not go there. Um, what I tested was, all right, who could own it? All right, it could be me. I prompt an LLM. So the user right? of the AI. There's the user of the AI. Then it could be the person that trained the AI. It could be the people that contributed to the training set. Of the so AI, the owners of the data, the yep. original data, owner of the data, it could be the person that coded the AI as well. Okay. Now, that's assuming that you don't have licensing issues either, and that, say, Facebook with their conditional GAN model doesn't own the license to Sumith Chintala's work. So all these people can potentially have a stake in it. So how do you apportion? copyright is it possible yeah. to own the output to something that the original programmer doesn't know exists yeah. <laughs> right so it ends up being a question of how much effort do you uh, yeah. Yeah. this is a very general and, sweeping and statement if anybody can use his ai models then will his be in infringement of any copyright if that ai generates something because the user has to yeah so that's infringement and response rights and responsibility who it's attributed to is a is a whole different ball game so yeah. it's the, the the person who who used the ai the person who coded the ai sure. the owner of the data yep and what about the ai what about the ai itself that's as it presently stands well a year ago <laughs> that wouldn't have been a question okay. right the human you ownership. needed you needed human ownership yeah now in 2020 when the paper was published i kind of hypothesized that hey there are cases where humans we found ways to give ownership to things that are not human so companies, companies right yeah. corporation law yeah. a company can own the intellectual property to something there's a human behind the company sure but you know, yeah. humans have figured out when to assign personhood because of an incentive thing so right persons want incentive to protect their inventions companies have incentives to protect also their inventions in the sense that they are investing on that so they want the ip protection yep. to yep. have the monopoly on that invention yep will the ai have an incentive also? so will we'll, right and i feel as though the only logical way forward um is if you're going to prescribe that personhood to ai there needs to be real people behind the ai so assigning some will be the company or the programmer exactly exactly and so that's the more rational way to go in my opinion and you know that there's a year ago canada india granted a patent to ai one of those two countries realized we fucked up and they flipped they flipped the decision i'm not sure if both have flipped it. i kind of lost track but i'm very glad that they flipped it because we haven't figured out what it means to sue an ai model does the AI feel goes to jail? Right. <laughs> goes to jail. Eh, it doesn't matter. Right? 
I just look like a model. I'm cool for you. So you right. are more team uh, company, team programmer, or team end user of the AI? Regarding as as in who will own it? Yeah. So th th it, this is tricky. I, I kind of give situations where different people may own different things. So in, in, in my view, I think if one person was to end to end create a model, then sure. Even if I didn't paint the image the typical way you would expect me to paint an image, I coded something and code itself is copyrightable. And I think that the things that are generated by that code should also have some downstream copyright um, prescribed to it. But in most practical cases, no one is the end-to-end -end creator, developer, et cetera, of their models. So one classic case before ChatGPT entered the arena, um, there was a, it's, it's quite fascinating, right? I'll, I'll tell you the story. So there was this, uh, at the time, I think he was 16 or 17 years old. This kid, he, um, he forked the DC GAN repo he retrained it using images like portraits taken from or painted in the 1800s and he generated a bunch of really beautiful artwork using DC GAN then subsequently uh, an art collective in France they got in touch with him and said hey awesome work could you help us retrain this? Or could you tell us how you did this so that we can retrain it and generate our own images? So they went ahead and retrained it. The output still looked quite similar to what the original kid, the 17 year old was generating, but you know, yeah, sure. They, they retrained it perhaps. And then they sold it at an auction for nearly half a million US dollars. Who owns that half a million US dollars? Okay. Now, ultimately, because there's so many, assuming licenses don't supersede any of the rights, the thought was that the output is in the public domain. The data set that the model was trained on, public domain. The student open sourced his code or whatever uh, changes he made to the code. So he may not necessarily have a right to say, you infringed uh, what I was generating or you, you infringed use of this, this, this DC GAN model. So it was found that, you know, I mean, th this hasn't gone to court, but the expectation is, and if you go onto Wikipedia and see this, the picture of Edmond de Bellamy, uh, the, the portrait that was sold, it's thought to be in the public domain because Wikipedia has it online okay. and they, they have that license there. If it's in the public domain, I can sell it, but then you can take it and equally sell it and I can't sue you for selling yeah. it, <laughs> right? So I think a lot of this work is going to end up in the public domain. Yeah. Language models, it's difficult with language models because I could, Plug, and this, I do this all the time, right? I have to fit my abstract in my research paper within 250 words, 260. I'll copy paste it and say, Smart. reduce this with minimal changes, <laughs> right? Does the 10 word scraping mean that OpenAI now own my words? I'd argue probably not. That stemmed from my brain. But then if I said, give me words, <laughs> Yeah. It's a different ballpark, yeah. right? Yeah. Of so course. how the user interacts with the AI, in my view, will have an impact on whether or not I will own the final words. Yeah. There is another aspect of this, not so much on the generation part, but on the input data. But mm. that's like a whole topic to discuss. Maybe we'll do a second part of, of the episode. Yeah. But there is a trend of people like trying to forbid uh, the usage of copyrighted data to train uh, AI models. Right, right, yeah. I do see the reasons of why will that happen because yeah. of course you want to keep the incentive on the authors to keep publishing yep. and being uh, rewarded by, by their work. There's a major risk that could happen if we uh, if we forbid AI models to mm -hmm. use uh, copyrighted data, which is we could only rely on public domain data. Mm -hmm. What is public domain data? Data that was published basically at least 70 years ago because the authors have to be dead 70 years ago to get into public domain yeah. plus most authors do not publish stuff when they die they publish stuff on their theories yeah you, you, you get chat gpt giving us shakespearean words only <laughs> and, and races yeah. and sure yeah with gender equality issues yeah. so when we are pushing for ai models not using copyrighted data we are also pushing for a lot of potential biases that could be from the war a hundred years ago and mm. i'm not saying that now we are in the perfect state of the war 
um, of course, a hundred years ago from now, they would think we are super biased, <laughs> yeah. right? But if we are not allowed to train with current data, then the models will be useless and not aligned with our current values as society. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I don't really have a clear pathway forward for that either. Yeah. Like, what, what is the right thing to do? I'm, I'm honestly not too sure. I don't think I'm the right authoritative person for that. Okay. But um, I, I think that there was, a, you know, there was a case from, I want to say 2020, uh, Google and the Supreme Court, people were trying to sue Google for training some of their models on books, just books that yeah. were copyrighted to the authors of those books. Um, and at the time in 2020, I believe that my memory is a bit foggy on this because I didn't keep up with what happened afterwards, but they, it was found that Google did have the rights to train their model okay. on open source books. Sorry, not open source books, but on closed proprietary books that had copyright. Oh, yep. Subsisting have copyright, in copyright, but that have PDFs <laughs> around on the web. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, the reason must have been because, look, they're not regenerating the same words. It's not, they're not plagiarizing it. They're maybe a human reading a book. It's like an AI parsing and doing gradient descent on word embeddings. It's not, you know, necessarily damaging the authors. And at the time, that could be true. Now you could argue the other direction and say, well, AI can generate words in the style of Shakespeare or whatever mm -hmm. your favorite author is. Um, and it could potentially devalue the types of work that humans are capable of producing. What does that mean? Does that mean that humans need to suck it up and push forward? Not sure. Does it mean that we need to maybe take the optimistic route and say, no, humans always want humans. Humans will always want the human touch. They want to hear what other people have to say. Um, yeah. That could be, that, 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 that's the optimistic view. I'm not sure it holds true for everyone. Um, I know that I definitely don't need to hire as many graphic designers whenever I want a, a title slide for my yeah. presentations because some stable diffusion model can generate that for me, right? <laughs> so there, there is a real yeah, it's world. It's pretty handy. It's pretty handy. It, At it, least it's pretty handy. It's pretty handy. <laughs> a lot of copy editors are potentially going to yeah. be put out of jobs uh, because of LLM being LLMs being able to clean up my. You know, is Grammarly leave that to you yeah, right potentially yeah potentially yeah right potentially, so yes. we will see i think i i i'm not going to say that you know things are going to be for the best things are going to be for the worst i think as people developing ai models as people with a voice in this community it's kind of up to us on which direction this goes in i don't think that there there is no clear answer on what that might be you know, there, there is the issue of alignment we're trying to figure out how can we make language models less biased Right. Amazon Alexa was struggling to understand uh, me Hispanic accents. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Couldn't understand you. I had to put on a fake American accent. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the more I sounded like a valley girl, the more likely it was going to understand. No, seriously, you adapt. I mean, when I'm with my Australian friends, then I start talking like this and I just turn into just full on Australian. Right. And, and yeah. They don't like that. <laughs> my yeah. fire stick isn't, doesn't like my Australian accent. Um, but, you know, we can fake it. Right, so do, do we fine-tune models to adapt to, to subsets of people? Okay, you can do that. I, I truly believe that's going to be at the expense of others. So if, if you know that it's only going to be used in one particular domain, sure, do it. I think that what's equally important is evaluating models very carefully. So it's more, more like a post hoc interpretability type yeah. of exercise. People are saying, oh, I love the example of Gemini, right? Oh, Gemini is too progressive. It made the Pope black. Okay, so that's one bias. That's, that's one bias there. But how can you give it a far more rigorous evaluation of what an LLM values? Does it even make sense to ask that question? Because different people take different values to mean different things. My definition of utilitarianism is very different to what my great, great, great grandfather's definition of utilitarianism was in Iran, <laughs> right? Fundamentally very different values. But I think it is possible not to do it perfectly, but at the very least to understand what an LLM or what, mod or what models that can 
exhibit some sort of bias, what they prioritize, right? So that's actually something that we're doing in my lab at the moment as well, which is, I mean, it, do, it doesn't fit your typical bucket of neuromorphic research at all, but I think, I don't know, human alignment, how much more brain-like does it get? I mean, ultimately, don't, isn't that what these spiking neural networks give rise to, consciousness and values, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of like a superset of spiking yeah. neural nets being able to, to quantify values. So no, we're trying to, it, 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 we learned that it is a really non-trivial task, right? Um, but we're trying to balance humanistic values and being able to generalize to different values and utility. Imagine you have an LLM that's trying to make insurance claims, right? Or maybe it's allocating who should get welfare, right? Who should get some child support? And the reality is, yeah, language models are going to be making decisions for some of the most vulnerable people in society. Like we already see cops, for example, using lang uh, not language models, but using machine learning models to dictate where they should be stationed at. Yeah. And then they just end up in black neighborhoods because AI is racist, right? Yeah. That's, that's what we've seen happen in the past already. Um, but I think, you know, you know what? I think that's a good thing, not, not the effect. Yeah. But the fact that moving the decision to an AI and not to a human makes the decision auditable, quantifiable, and fixable. I mean, to a point, to, to a, a point. point. Yeah, AI point. is easier to quantify than humans. That is true, but they're not, yeah, they're still not easy to quantify. But at least you right? can replicate yeah. the experiment and say, hey, this thing is biased. With a human, the human will always say, no, 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 it wasn't biased. <laughs> but with true, AI, yeah. you can actually measure the bias. Right, right. You can probe different parts of your model, figure out what part of a model is going to lead to a certain domain of knowledge. Humans, we can't probe like that at the moment, right? We can't probe the, the entire brain. So, so I got this view that we'll never really right we, we can understand how to train neural networks we can understand how to train them better we can in the same way understand how the brain learns particular things but i think we're always going to struggle with the question of why it decided to go down one route as opposed to another why did this weight become 0 0.7132 <laughs> right we'll never really be able to capture that level of specificity which is why I think we need this post hoc interpretability. So you've trained it, you've identified what parts of the model gives rise to what types of values, what instills what in the model. Um, and then if at the very least you can quantify that this model prioritizes utilitarianism over following the law, well then that's, that's useful to know. And then you can put guardrails on not necessarily the development of the AI, which can be done as well, but rather where it gets deployed. Right. So interpreting what a language model can do is, is really fucking important. The more I work in AI and the more projects we take and the more conversations like this we have, I'm more convinced that we will have spiking neural networks on real life fully deployed applications than we will close the debates on bias, <laughs> IP yeah. law, yeah. Uh, all the soft problems, all the human problems, all the decision, actual final decision risk, assessment problems that we have. So I think training AI models is solve all the human problems around how we are going to deal with this it's like completely open and i know it's not fully solved i know you know we have other problems no comment uh, okay we still have to train models i still yeah. have to but we are at a point where we are very good at training prediction machines where we are good at training ai models mm. and now we are just starting the journey of the impact that this could have on a day-to-day -day life yeah. in a business on the processes of that business etc yeah in chip design the in the 80s it was um no okay chip design integration of transistors onto a single silicon chip a few years later they were like damn that's a lot of transistors let's call it a new field large-scale integration of transistors a few years later damn we just went 10x it's now vlsi very large-scale yes. integration <laughs> and so i think that we kind of fucked up by calling large language models large yeah. in 2021 2022 yeah it will be tiny, tiny. we're gonna have v llms yeah. vvv llms yeah Maybe yeah, yeah. I, I agree journey's just getting started and it's up to us kind of where that pathway takes yeah. us hey and thank you for being part of it today no i appreciate uh, you the invitation thank you uh, so i always like to end up with three book recommendations for the audience 
They don't have to be AI books. They can be yeah. law books law or books. articles. Okay. Um, all right. Mind f- okay. Mind f- is a great book. It um, put me down the road of understanding the real world tangible dangers of AI. Not the potential dangers, but the dangers that we've already faced as a society and where we f***ed up. It's really what made me cynical about my own research and made me realize that this is, this is a powerful tool we've got and a lot of people aren't using it for the betterment of society, how it's influenced political decision-making, etc. Strongly recommend that for a really grounded view of where we've gone wrong already using recommender systems. Shout out to Facebook. Um, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Okay, you know, a lot of sleep scientists might call it sensationalist. It's fine. But it is a great, great view on how important sleep is. (laughs) Um, The night that I finished reading it, it was so kind of sobering that I couldn't sleep. Like, no, and, no. You, and you don't have kids. I, don't know. You know, I have a, a three years old toddler and another one on the way. <laughs> and then you realize how good sleep right, is. Don't, don't read it. Don't, don't. <laughs> All right. If you have kids between the age of zero and eight, don't read this book. Um, <laughs> um, third book, Live Wired. Live Wired is, um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful book. That it's a bit more optimistic on the untapped powers of the brain. Uh, I don't want to call it pop science because there is real hardcore science there to back it up, but it is accessible to people that are not scientists. It tells you how the brain is adaptive, how that's been explored and how it's been exploited for you know addressing disabilities. People that don't have sight can ultimately use their visual cortex to see via touch. Um, so it, gi- it gives a lot of promise in neuromorphic computing, which is, I have to say, it's not just spikes, right? Spikes are just one of many ways that we can take inspiration from the brain. Um, and the brain is pretty fucking powerful. So we got to look at what, what else is out there beyond just spikes. That's my three books. I didn't say Harry Potter. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jason, for being here. It was an honor to have you. And I hope to have you on another episode sometime. Yeah. All right, drag my out to Porto another time. Let's do it. <laughs> and thank you guys for being here. Watch. Uh, see you in the next episode. Bye bye. <laughs>